Hello and welcome to this special global briefing webinar, Lines in the Hills, Indo-Chinese Rivalry in the Himalayas. The webinar is brought to you by the Lao China Institute and King's India Institutes in the School of Global Affairs at King's College London. My name is Louise Tillin, I'm Director of the King's India Institute and a leader in politics, and I will be chairing today's discussion. A little bit of housekeeping before we begin. We'll start the webinar by hearing from each of our panelists for about 10 minutes each, before opening out into a live discussion involving questions from the audience. You will be able to use the question and answer function, the Q&A function to post questions, and you should find that at the bottom of your screen next to the chat function in Zoom. And I will then convey questions to the panel. We're aiming to conclude the discussions by about 1.15 um, UK time. I'm really delighted to introduce this um, panel today, and I will introduce our panelists in the order we'll hear from them. First of all, Professor Harsh Pant, who joins us from Delhi. Uh, Harsh wears two hats. Um, Harsh is both a professor of international relations at the India Institute here at King's, and is also director of research at the Observer Research Foundation in New Delhi. Harsh has written extensively on Indian foreign and nuclear policy, and on wider security issues in Asia. Uh, secondly, we will hear from Professor Kerry Brown, Director of the Lao China Institute and Professor of Chinese Studies at King's. Kerry is joining us from his car uh, somewhere in rural Oxfordshire, uh, and he will reveal himself to you uh, when his turn comes. Um, Kerry is the author of over 10 books about modern China, including most recently, The World According to Xi, everything you need to know about China. Thirdly on our panel, we have Dr. Nicola Leveringhouse, lecturer in East Asian security and international relations in the Department of War Studies at King's. Nicola is an expert in China's international relations and in particular questions related to the role of nuclear weapons in Asian security. And lastly, I would like to introduce Dr. Walter Ladwig, who is a senior lecturer in international relations in the Department of War Studies at King's and also a senior fellow with the South Asia program at the East West Institute in New York. Walter's research focuses on military strategy, counterinsurgency, and US foreign policy, as well as the implications of India's emergence as a great power. So it is a real privilege to be able to bring together this panel of experts from Kings, but based uh, in different corners of the world. Um, it, we are privileged to be able to host a discussion which marries the uh, expertise here in both India and China in order to explore the recent escalation of tensions between these two rival regional powers along the so-called line of actual control between the two countries in Ladakh in the Himalayas. In June, tensions along this disputed border spilled over into a, into a violent confrontation in which at least 20 Indian soldiers lost their lives. Whether there were any casualties on the Chinese side has remained unclear. This was the worst violence between the two nuclear armed countries since the 1962 India-China war. Despite the warm public relationship between Narendra Modi and Xi Jinping, strains in bilateral relations between China and India have been evident in recent years. These are reflected both in trade tensions um, and also competing infrastructural projects in the borderlands between these two countries. While India and China have taken steps towards de-escalation in the last few days, wider questions remain around the reasons for the latest confrontation and its ongoing strategic significance. So I'd like to turn to Harsh first um, and ask, ask, Harsh, could you set the scene for us? Um, why has this region of the Himalayas been the flashpoint for tensions between the two countries, first in 1962 and again today? Do you see it? Do you see this as a as a localized conflict over a, a kind of specific boundary dispute, or is it indicative of a wider shift in their strategic relationship? Uh, thank you, Louise, and thank you um, uh, for having me as part of this web panel. I think it's uh, it's wonderful to be able to engage uh, with scholars uh, who come from very different uh, vantage points and are looking at this question from their own uh, research interests perspective. Uh, uh, so I'll add my two bits. I think the first point I would like to make is that uh, since yesterday there has been this argument uh, in the media and there has been the sense in the media and that perhaps uh, a process of disengagement has started in the Himalayas. Uh, 
uh, that the two militaries, uh, after uh, some very concerted efforts by the two sides, uh, are withdrawing gradually. Uh, however, that might play out over the next few uh, days and weeks. I think that there is a fundamental point here that, that uh, one needs to acknowledge, that Sino-Indian relations have altered for good. And I think this is uh, something that uh, is going to shape their engagement with each other going forward, uh, whether or not this particular crisis gets resolved in, in one particular direction or not. And I think that larger, that larger sort of uh, big picture is very worrying because it means that two Asian powers uh, jostling for influence, it was already happening before, but it gets much more aggravated uh, and it gets, more, it gets much, much more accentuated going forward. So I think, you know, when, once you look at this boundary issue today, it has, it has bounced back to the core of this relationship. And that is the big change that has happened. For a long time, the argument was that, look, there is a problem uh, at, at the boundary. It's a, it's a problem that dates back to as, you know, you can go back all the way to 1914, uh, when the British India signed uh, the, the deal with Tibet, uh, independent Tibet, uh, which, which resulted in the, in the present day boundaries, which China does not recognize, but India uh, frames its response as part of that engagement. Uh, but clearly, you know, the attempt for, for the two sides was to nurture a relationship that sort of keeps this boundary dispute in abeyance. Uh, that yes, we can talk about the boundary question, but let not that boundary question overshadow the larger relationship. And that has been that that acknowledgement, uh, you know, that uh, sentiment has been ruptured, uh, perhaps irretrievably, by what has happened in the last uh, few weeks uh, and, and last month. And that challenges some of our notions about how do we understand this relationship, how we understand Indian foreign policy, and how do we understand China's response to, the, uh, to its periphery, which, uh, which you know, there's a broader debate to be had, and Kerry is, is, a, is a better person to talk about that. But, you know, going back to the questions that you posed about the, the, the boundary problem, as I said, you can take it back to 1914, uh, but you can also take it to the sort of this, this idea that here were in 1947, there were these, uh, you know, and, and later on, uh, in late 1940s, you had two post-colonial entities that were trying to engage with each other, uh, each other as, as independent nations. And so the boundary question clearly was important because sovereignty, defining the terms of their sovereign engagement was important. Now that uh, led uh, to uh, a fundamental change in late 1950s when China annexed Tibet. So that annexation changed the contours of this engagement because India really never had any direct boundaries with China. Uh, in, uh, Tibet was the buffer. So India's, uh, you know, in, in many in India would say we should call the boundary that we share with China Indo-Tibetan boundary because it's, it's that boundary that India shares with Tibet, not with China directly. But once you had Tibet being annexed by China, the whole complexion of this relationship changed. Uh, you had Tibet entering frontally into this engagement uh, and those, uh, you know, who have even read basic history would know uh, how the idea of Asian solidarity, post-colonial Asian solidarity, uh, was sort of uh, drowned away, was taken away uh, by, the, by the rise of, uh, of uh, you know, Sino-Indian rivalry along the Tibetan question. So from 50s to 1962, you see an ex escalation in tensions, you see the big 1962 war, and that fundamentally is what has, has been shaping or what has been the overhang over this relationship. The 62 war, the humiliation, uh, that in many Indians feel India, India felt at the hands of the Chinese, a defeat. Uh, that was a, you know, sort of the, the trigger that led to a different context from the Hindi Chini Bhai Bhai, uh, the, the, the slogan of the early 1940s, 50s, and, uh, you know, uh, which Pandit Nehru, India's first prime minister, was trying to revive the sense that two, China and India needs to work together for Asian solidarity. That sentiment uh, disappeared in 1962, and, and a new phase starts where India starts uh, looking at China through a more realistic lens and how to engage China on its own terms. Now, obviously, it's a difficult question because you have been, you have been defeated. And uh, that, that defeat lends itself uh, to certain psychological issues in this relationship. Uh, there, there's a whole generation of Indian leadership that is born with that, you know, with that burden of history. Uh, but what, you know, I think the fundamental argument there is that that, 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 uh, uh, the territory, the, the, the boundary question uh, remains uh, unresolved. It, it has remained unresolved. And despite attempts by the two sides to come to some sort of an understanding, 
uh, it has not really moved forward despite several mechanisms that emerge. So, uh, you know, uh, as in, your, in your introduction, Luis, you talked about how uh, this was the worst, uh, what happened last month, and I'll come to that in a bit, uh, it was the worst crisis uh, ha that has happened in recent memory. Uh, and this is, you know, this, this uh, lends itself to this larger issue that here is this boundary, which is 3,488 kilometers approximately. Uh, India claims it is that, uh, it, it's the length of the boundary, which is disputed. So it is the, the longest undemarcated boundary between any two nations in the world at, the, at this point. And that means that since 1950s, this has been the situation. We have not been able to, the two nations have not been able to demarcate it. And clearly the burden of that is often expressed through the military provocations that happen. Now, one good thing that had happened over the last few years, uh, over the last several decades, is that gradually, as I, was, as I pointed earlier, the realization that you need to keep the boundary question in abeyance meant that some mechanisms were developed, some standard operating procedures were developed, that yes, there are different perceptions of what you call as the line of actual control, which is the boundary. Uh, but there are different perceptions of that boundary, so transgressions would happen. Sometimes Indian soldiers would move into the Chinese side unknowingly, and sometimes Chinese soldiers would do that. And therefore, in order to prevent a larger conflict from escalating, you need some procedures. And there, there are some generic procedures emerge. You would have, you would hold the banners. The other side would hold the banner and tell the other side, go back. This is our land. Or you would have, uh, you know, if a uh, crisis escalated, the local commanders would take charge of the, of, of the problem, and they would diffuse it at that level. So clearly what had happened was that the political leadership had decided that the two sides would concentrate on the larger strategic picture of the relationship, while the territory issue uh, can be engaged with, uh, you know, uh, through the special representatives mechanism. But at the local level, tactical level, this would mean that the local commanders would handle it on a day-to-day -day basis. Now, those understandings are breaking down. And that is a problem at the moment, that we do not have an alternative to those mechanisms. What Mr. Modi tried to do after Doklam uh, in 2017 was to... Uh, tried to create another level here, which was an informal level, which was reaching out directly to Xi Jinping and uh, from the top level leadership and saying that, look, our formal mechanisms on the boundary question are not working. Uh, so let's have this informal mechanism so that if there is a crisis on the border, the top leadership can talk to each other. Now, what we have seen over the last few weeks and months is even that is not working. That, that the top, there's a, there's a mistrust at the top that is, you know, that is also creating a vacuum in this, uh, in, in this Sino-Indian matrix. So now, very briefly, what, had, what has happened, as I was saying, you know, transgressions have been normal in this relationship at the boundary. But since 2013, and that is where, an, and I'll come to that assessment in a bit, an assessment that India is making is that 20, since 2013, we have seen an escalation in, in, in the boundary transgressions, in the aggressiveness with which Chinese soldiers have been pushing uh, along the boundary. And that has resulted in a series of uh, conflicts. There is a, uh, a series of uh, localized conflicts. Uh, there was 2013 uh, Begley, uh, you know, episode. And then 2017, the major episode of Doklam, where the two sides actually came eyeball to eyeball, did not fight. Uh, but it resulted in what I was talking about, the Modi-Shi uh, informal mechanism. And then, of course, this year, since early May, reports uh, were emerging that uh, Chinese uh, are pushing at multiple fronts along the LAC. And this was, uh, you know, what is called the Galwan Valley in eastern Ladakh. In, and this is part, largely this was happening in Ladakh area. Although early May, this was also happening in Sikkim. There's a point called Nakula where, where, in, uh, where uh, Chinese were pushing it. Uh, but that, that got resolved. But what, what uh, since early May we have seen is that Ladakh had become the new focal point of this conflict. And... Uh, multiple fronts that the two sides were pushing into each other uh, and Indian side of course responded Chinese side also uh, it's Chinese side pushed into as, as far as India was concerned and that resulted in uh, in uh, in a sense that look something major can happen and so local level commanders could not handle it it went to the coal level coal commander level engagement and we got a sense in in early June that things were coming uh, under control and suddenly, as, these, as, a, as a disengagement process was starting in early June, by mid-June, June, uh, the night of June 15, you had the major crisis in the Galvan Valley, where uh, in, you know, the, the soldiers, uh, in, 20 Indian soldiers uh, got killed, and uh, some uh, unspecified numbers of casualties on the Chinese side, we don't know. So there has been some, uh, and, that, and that had been, again, a, you know, a, a big shift in the way India now perceives this question. So the point that I made at the very beginning 
what used to be on the periphery of Sino-Indian engagement is now frontly at the center. India believes that trade, culture, other exchanges, other engagements with China cannot be pursued if boundary question is not resolved with a degree of seriousness, if China does not show a seriousness of intent uh, towards resolving this. And that shift, I think, is very, very serious because that means that all those factors that, that uh, a lot of the scholars, a lot of policymakers counted as factors that would uh, create a, a buffer in, in, in this relationship, trade, for example, uh, that has not really worked to India's advantage. We are in, 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 and therefore, something that you mentioned in your intro as well, we are seeing a trade conflict as well emerging uh, in response to this crisis. Even before this crisis, India was tightening rules as far as Chinese companies were concerned, whether they were in FDI, whether in, they were in critical sectors in India, and a lot of other areas as well, as far as the trade and economic relationship is concerned. There is a sense in India that over-dependence on China on critical sectors is a bad idea. Technology decoupling, possibly a trade decoupling, is something that India should go for. Again, it's a long haul. It will not happen again. But the, you know, I, I would conclude by just saying that the, the, what has happened with this crisis is that we are going to witness a larger shift in Indian foreign policy. What was an undercurrent uh, that you had to counter China through various means, whether partnerships, whether internal balancing, whether engaging China, has now resulted in a policy that openly would make, uh, I, I mean, I can hypothesize at this point only as a, as a student uh, of, of this relationship, that I think now what we are going to witness is India would explicitly make anti-Chinese choices. They can be strategic choices, they can be economic choices, they can be choices about what India wants to do uh, you know, militarily on the border. But what we are witnessing now is a re-evaluation of, of a lot of these assumptions that, that, that were part of this, uh, of this uh, relationship. Finally, the final point I want to make is that what has happened in the border, uh, uh, what, has, what, the, 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 what has happened, the crisis, that, that, uh, the, the latest crisis in the Galvan Valley, is also a function of India's more proactive infrastructure policy, more proactive military policy on the border. So it, it, it is also something that the Chinese are preempting India. There is a 255 kilometer uh, uh, road, uh, strategic road from all the way from Ladakh, Lane, Ladakh to Karakoram Pass that India has managed to build. And this has happened after decades. Something that was not happening before, uh, it, both in terms of Indian infrastructure, both in terms of India's military positioning, is happening now, and that is, that is also something that is concerning China. So there is this, this conflict can also be seen as a warning shot uh, that uh, to India to, to, uh, to respect the red lines that in Chinese views are important. So from both perspectives, we are witnessing a changing of status quo in this relationship, and that will have some very long-term impacts for this relationship as well as for Asian geopolitics. Thank you. Thank you, Harsh. Um, I'd like to bring in Kerry next, if I may. And, and Kerry, really to pick up on, on much there that Harsh has said, um, Narendra Modi and Xi Jinping have invested heavily and very publicly um, in their personal relationship. Um, there's been a lot of high profile summitry um, by uh, some estimates, the two premiers have, have conducted more bilateral visits than any previous pair of premiers in India and China. Um, and that you know, informal dialogue had helped to maintain a sense of stability um, despite um, events like Doppler um, in, in recent years. Um, I, I wanted to ask you to reflect a little on, from Beijing's point of view, how important is the relationship with India at the moment? And how concerned is Beijing about India's response to um, to, to, to what's happened in Ladakh. Great, well thanks very much. Um, so I suppose there's sort of three ways to approach this. The first is uh, the logic of nationalism in both places. So, you know, they're obviously uh, in a period of uh, nationalistic, I suppose, uh, sort of strengthening. Uh, Modi and Xi Jinping are, are both nationalists. I think that wouldn't be a controversial statement. And I suppose the kind of question really is, is Asia or the world big enough for this kind of these these different kinds of nationalisms and are we actually witnessing a sort of competition between them because of their visions for their region the way that China spells out the Belt and Road Initiative which China doesn't like um, and, and you know is this going to be something where the two can accommodate each other or are these recent clashes on the border 
uh, symptomatic of the fact that in fact Asia is not big enough for these powers and maybe not the world either. Uh, the second, I suppose, approach is to look at what's Beijing prior what's Beijing's priorities. So Harsh has spoken a lot about you know the kind of India uh, perspective on this. That the Beijing perspective um, obviously is a world now where it has serious issues with the United States. Um, it has serious issues over its management of Hong Kong with the national security law already implemented only a few days ago. It has a major strategic priority over the management of Taiwan and that issue. And it is because of COVID-19 now experiencing major diplomatic issues across the whole world with Europe, with the UK. So India kind of, where does it occur in that? Um, well, India is obviously a very, very significant partner. Uh, and obviously with this live issue of the contested borders, not one that uh, China has a, an easy framework to fit into. Um, these are, you know, kind of really mysterious powers in a way, because India and China, you would think having neighbored each other for a long, long time, I, you know, for uh, all of their respective recorded histories, <laughs> um, you, you think that they would have invested a lot in understanding and knowing each other. And I suppose my puzzle really is that I don't see a lot of attempts in Beijing to really understand India. Um, I, I mean, maybe that's terribly unfair and there must be excellent people in the Ministry of Foreign Affairs and in the various think tanks who do think a lot about India, but I don't find them very easily and I haven't really for 20 years. And I've, I've always been puzzled by that. Why is it, you know, that there are good places in India where China is studied, not a huge number, but, you know, there are some very, very good experts um, and you come across them and I mean, they really do invest in understanding China's language and culture and uh, politics but I don't see it reciprocated much. Um, and so I, I wonder whether, you know, that's symptomatic of a kind of cultural disdain by China towards India. And that this is going to become more and more of an issue because, you know, India has a vast capacity. It's a valid vision for the region. It's got certain kind of massive advantages, of course, because of its politics. I mean, whatever you think about the politics of India, it's nowhere near as contentious as that of China. And so these are, I think, issues that, you know, kind of give it advantages, even though its economy is still at the moment much smaller. Um, so, you know, that kind of this, this, I suppose this sort of, you call it almost epistemological kind of asymmetry to be sort of some pompous. I mean, you know, this knowledge imbalance is really interesting. China has invested a lot in understanding uh, the EU. It's invested a lot in understanding America. Uh, but it really has not, I, I think, really kind of tried to understand India a great deal. And, and that almost seems to me symptomatic of a kind of sort of dictatorial stance, really, that this is all going to kind of be happening according to the way China wants. And I mean, China is not complacent about many of its other relationships, but I, I sort of feel that it is a bit about India. So I think that that is, that is going to become an increasing issue. So the priorities are really, really, uh, I think, kind of important. This is you know, for India, I think uh, a significant issue that it is attending to. For China, I, I really, really wonder um, whether it's got so much on its plate at the moment and it's really, really kind of stretched and that this is sort of kind of a, a, a sign of that, the fact that it's looking in many, many different directions at the moment and it's got these aspirations and it's kind of having to get on top of those in a very, very short period. I suppose the sort of final thing really is a bit about scenarios. I, I mean, with the uh, kind of recent clashes, I guess the sort of view has been that in Beijing, while the, the kind of military have acted in this um, sort of fairly aggressive and proactive way, uh, the diplomats have spoken in a much more measured way. Um, and so there's a sort of sign, and we see this in other areas, that this kind of seamless, sometimes almost, um, you know, kind of monolithic exterior that China tries to promote a lot now under Xi Jinping, uh, does have clear sort of fissures and cracks. And, you know, it seems that the diplomats certainly understand that this is a relationship where at the moment they do not want an enormous amount of kind of, you know, fights. And secondly, you know, they kind of feel that there's the sort of, I think the world divides between preserve the status quo and be active. And this is an area where I think uh, the diplomats seem to want to preserve the status quo. Um, in a lot of other issues, I think that they are uh, getting on the front foot, basically. I, I mean, with America and uh, 
you know, to issues where they have to. But with India, I think their thinking is to just maintain the status quo. But obviously, you know, the military and the command in the military, it's always been a bit of a mystery. The assumption is under Xi Jinping, it's highly kind of hierarchical and that he really, really constructs and, and directs things in a very seamless way. But it's always sort of been a bit of an indication with India, you know, that in fact, the border issues, it's, it's not so straightforward. And, it, you know, it's very impulsive sometimes. This seems quite impulsive, what's happened recently. When Xi Jinping, you know, visited India, I think a couple of years ago, there was again another spat on the board. And it seemed curious timing. And, you know, I suppose the only thing I'd say about that is that the politics of the Xi Jinping era is there's no downside to being zealous. You can't really be sacked for being in love with the chairman too much or the president too much. You, you know, you can't, you, you can certainly be sacked for not loving him enough. But, you know, if you're acting overzealously, that is a sort of um, a venal sin rather than a cardinal sin. Um, and so I wonder whether that's part of it, that, you know, the kind of um, people on the border um, they, they kind of just have to sort of act in a very, very proactive way. And there's no downside to that. So I, you know, kind of think that uh, this, this is a really amazing issue to see China's current, current foreign, foreign policy. Um, it is symptomatic of China's ambitions and aspirations. It's also symptomatic of the thing I say in conclusion of the fact that uh, the reason why this kind of webinar and other events like this are so important is if there is one relationship at the moment that the world is deeply complacent about, it is the India-China relationship. And yet I think that is the relationship that could be the most problematic. Uh, I mean, India and America, sorry, China and America kind of have to, I mean, unless it's total devastation, have to find a way through with India and China, you can really see this spiraling very, easy out, very easily out of control. So we should never be complacent about this relationship. Thank you. Thanks very much, Kerry. Um, I'd like now to bring in Nicola, Nicola Levick, in the Ring House. Um, and Nicola, to ask, you've worked um, extensively on the history of Chinese nuclear thinking, and this is something we haven't examined yet in this webinar, the significance that both India and China are, of course, nuclear powers. And I know in some of your work, you've also looked specifically at Chinese views of India as a nuclear power. Um, so given um, your work on these questions, how do you view the implications of the current escalation? And perhaps specifically, it would be interesting to hear you reflect on the relevance of the fact that both are nuclear armed states. Um, what does that uh, mean for how the two countries view each other, um, how they view the risks of further escalation, um, and the extent to which there is a kind of status quo bias implicit in, in their relationship, despite all of the risks that we've just heard about. Yeah, thanks. Thanks, Louise. Um, I mean, I think um, when we think about the border conflict between these two countries, if you see the media reporting, even in the recent crisis, you know, often, you know, gets stated of their nuclear arms, right? They might be actively uh, modernizing their arsenals, nuclear arsenals, which is what they're doing. But there's never much deeper interrogation to that, right? I mean, there seems to be this implied assumption, I guess, in a lot of the reporting that uses that sort of description that, you know, these, this, this is a big problem, a big political problem, but it's also one that could go nuclear, right? That there could be, in a way, this escalation to nuclear war, right? So I guess the question is, what is the likelihood of, of, of that prospect, right? Um, so in my own work, I've argued that the likelihood is rather low, uh, but that doesn't mean we should be sort of complacent, right? You know, as, as Kerry said, we shouldn't be complacent about this relationship. Um, it is true that the reporting in China during this particular crisis um, has been slightly different in the nuclear context to previous crises. So for those that haven't followed the media reporting in this, in this current crisis compared to previous crises, um, China has started to use the language of its nuclear arsenal in a way it hasn't used it before. So, for instance, it's, you know, it's argued that, um, you know, China has many more nuclear warheads than India, right? Um, so it's made it clear to domestic audiences in China that if this were to get into, a, into a, you know, escalate up, China has a strategic advantage, right? That sort of narrative is a relatively new narrative. Now, with that said, I still think my overall assessment and argument that the likelihood of nuclear war or escalation to a threat of nuclear war is still relatively low. 
despite that recent Chinese media reporting narrative, which is, as I say, a, a, a relatively new thing. I'm going to I'm going to sort of sketch out three three sort of positions um, when it comes to this nuclear element of that relationship. So the first is the traditional nuclear deterrence argument, which um, you know is 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 a very strong argument, which is the argument that as these two countries are modernizing their nuclear arsenals, that could be perceived as a stabilizing thing, as a good thing, right? Because both these these countries are trying to develop an ability where they sort of have an assured capability to destroy one another. That sounds truly awful, of course, but in, in the sort of logic or illogical logic of nuclear deterrence, achieving some level of um, uh, assured destruction or, or, or mutual vulnerability is seen, is, is seen within this school as stabilizing, right? So the logic is, is actually as they grow to a certain level, of course, um, that will actually mean that they sort of cancel out, as it were, um, each other. And, and the nuclear option will become so um, awful and horrifying that the cost of using that option will be so unacceptable to the other side that they won't be tempted to use it in the first place. Right? So that's sort of the this, this school of deterrence, which tells us to be reassured, right, that uh, nuclear armed states won't go to, to, to war with each other. Now, they, we can poke lots of holes in that, but that's this sort of the big position. And certainly people like Vipin Narang, Taylor Fravel, they've put forward that argument um, to some extent in relation to these two powers. An argument I put forward with Professor Sullivan um, de Strada at the University of Oxford is that we actually need to look more at the domestic level rather than think about simply nuclear deterrence is some natural law that works automatically irrespective of culture irrespective of the bilateral relationship and other issues right um, we need to look at the sort of the how each country views packages frames and talks about its nuclear arsenal particularly as these two countries are modernizing their nuclear arsenal so what kind of currency does it have politically and domestically for each country right in this case china China and India. And so we've argued in our work that um, there is an element of competitive restraint going on. Um, and that what that means is that despite the, both these countries modernizing their nuclear arsenals, there are aspects of their nuclear arsenals that are actually symbolic of restraint. And they're quite different symbols to other nuclear armed states. So let me give you an example. So both China and India maintain a no first use principle, which um, basically says that they would not use nuclear weapons first, that they would actually use them in a second strike, in, in retaliation only. There are some caveats in the Indian case. Now, it could be that it's just a political pledge, but it's something that's very important to both states and they, in their declaratory policy. It's something that distinguishes them and that they talk about a lot, particularly in the Chinese case, uh, and that they've maintained some level of consistency with since China became a nuclear weapon state in 19... 1964. Um, so the, the domestic level is important. They want to see, be seen as different nuclear weapon states. And so sometimes they try to portray themselves as responsible. Again, we can, we can question their levels of success in that regard. But China, for instance, under Xi Jinping, has, has labelled um, uh, the country a responsible nuclear weapon state um, um, for, for some time now. And of course, India has also um, benefited from that term being used particularly by the United States, for instance, in its relationship um, with India. So there are elements of competitive restraint and moderation where both countries sort of compete against which are each other to some extent to show who is responsible and, and, who is, and who is restrained. A third area where I think, again, I don't want to be complacent, but I think it's an area where we sort of need to be more sober um, is to think about each country's views on nuclear escalation more generally. Um, and in this case, um, if I focus on China in particular, um, China has a slightly different view about nuclear escalation compared to certain other nuclear weapon states. So China um, believes that conventional conflicts can remain conventional. Um, and it seems to have, perhaps this is because of the structure of its command and control, which is very centralized through the Central Military Commission. Um, it believes that conventional conflicts, um, the risk of them crossing a threshold into the nuclear sort of scene um, are lower than what other nuclear weapon states think, in particular the United States. But the, the nuance to the Chinese position is once a conflict becomes nuclear, it cannot be managed, it cannot be controlled. 
that there is no um, potential for limited nuclear war. That's, a, again, a different position to many other nuclear weapon states. The United States, for instance, it feels quite the opposite. It believes that nuclear war can be, can be limited um, and it could possibly be managed. So the Chinese do have very different views about escalation um, in, in, in the nuclear context. And on the one hand, it could be comforting to think that the Chinese feel that any conventional conflict can be managed and that there isn't a need to go to the nuclear threshold. Um, on the other hand, of course, it's not very comforting to think that once that nuclear threshold has been crossed, and there's a huge debate about what that looks like, that threshold, uh, then it cannot be managed and anything is on, on, on the table. So, as I say, there are many dynamics to this sort of the, the nuclear angle, which, you know, you need to go into rather than simply saying these are two nuclear armed states that are, are modernizing um, their arsenals. I think there are some positive stabilizing dynamics. I talked about competitive restraint. Um, I think um, there are, of course, some negative, um, the fact that they both are deploying uh, naval nuclear capabilities um, in the nearby seas, um, which seem rather unnecessary um, to their overall sort of strategic deterrent against each other. So there are both positive and negatives. Um, and I think sort of interrogating those um, below, below simply saying that they're nuclear armed states and, um, is, 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 I think, useful and hopefully something that we, you know, with this crisis, we can talk about more and more, right? Um, it's not simply um, these are nuclear armed states and they're modernizing their nuclear arsenal. So I leave it there. Thank you very much, Nicola. Um, and lastly, um, I'd like to bring in Walter Landwick. Um, Walter, we've, we've heard mention of the US in, in the margins, really, of, of much of what's been said um, so far, but I'd like to bring it centre stage now, really, and ask if you could reflect on, on the historical relationship between the US with India and China, respectively, and how we should read the current scenario of India-China relations against the shifting sands of a Trump White House engaged in a much more confrontational policy towards China. Great, thanks, Louise. I'll, I'll uh, address that by talking about the past, the present, and uh, the, a bit about the future. Um, it's clear that since the end of the Second World War, there has been a very obvious linkage in US relations with both China and India. In fact, I'll take this opportunity to plug uh, for those of you who want a book-length treatment on the topic, Tanvi Madan's new book, Fateful Triangle, which she launched at King's in February, is an excellent summary of these particular dynamics during the Cold War. But in summary, you know, at, at independence or at Indian independence, South Asia was pretty much seen as a strategic backwater from Washington's standpoint. It was only after two very clear China-related episodes that this changed. And that was, of course, the communist victory in the Chinese Civil War in October 1949 and the outbreak of the Korean War in June 1950. So after this point, the U.S. really started to care a lot about South Asia. And although the Truman administration did not succeed in cultivating India as a strategic partner, Washington did not give up hope there. So as we get into the mid-1950s, into the end of the 1950s, there's a sharp downturn that Harsh has already talked about uh, with respect to uh, Sino-Indian ties. Um, and Washington sees this as an opportunity to try to cultivate relations with Delhi. So you have you know, increased Chinese forcefulness on the border. You have the suppression of a series of armed revolts in Tibet. The Eisenhower administration you know, basically makes India the largest recipient or one of the largest recipients of American economic aid in the world. The Kennedy administration, which succeeds him, goes even further. Kennedy openly downplays, you know, America's multiple military alliances with Pakistan in an effort to gain India's favor. Now, parenthetically, right, it's not just the U.S. who's linking these things. The fact that, um, the fact that Prime Minister Nehru gave asylum to the Dalai Lama and thousands of his followers in March 1959 was seen in Beijing as a clear evidence that U.S. and India were actually in league because the U.S. via the CIA was arming and equipping Tibetan rebels during this period of time. So we get to a position by the 1962 Sino-Indian War. The United States strongly denounces Chinese attack on India. Prime Minister Nehru reaches out to the United States, among other countries, for military aid. And after the conflict, the Kennedy administration really tries to increase its economic assistance, increase its military assistance, and thinks there's an opportunity to, to bring India into some kind of informal alignment. Now, they also link this increased aid to a resumption of talks with Pakistan over Kashmir, which does not seem to be something India wants to do. 
India looks to the, the USSR as a strategic partner instead, if we flash forward to the 1970s, then we see a very different configuration of these powers. The Nixon administration, as part of its Cold War foreign policy, has had its opening to China. So when the 1971 war, uh, one war comes, we have the United States and China sort of on the same side, as it were, backing Pakistan and the, United, and the Soviet Union and India, which had signed a, a treaty of friendship and cooperation kind of along the same lines, which very, very different position than we saw just nine years previous. Then, of course, the end of the Cold War creates an opportunity for a reset in these various relations. It's begun under Bill Clinton, but really pursued energetically by the George W. Bush uh, administration. We see the cultivation of a proper strategic partnership between the U.S. and India, which is informed on some levels by mutual concerns about China's growing power in Asia. So, you know, th throughout this history, the relations between these, these countries um, do have linkages, and there is connections between actions in one and dynamics in the other. So turning to the present and the present crisis, what's really striking to me is the degree to which the Trump administration and, and starting with President Trump have explicitly linked actions along the line of control to uh, territorial disputes elsewhere. So President Trump via uh, spokespeople have, have suggested this is part of a broader pattern of, of Chinese behavior. It confirms the true nature of the Chinese Communist Party. Um, Secretary of State Pompeo has been even more sweeping, so he's gone beyond just the South China Sea, but he's also referenced, um, you know, uh, repression in Xinjiang and Hong Kong and the cover-ups and misdirections surrounding COVID, essentially kind of putting these part and parcel together in the narrative that the CCP is essentially an out-of-control rogue actor. Now, it, it might be, uh, uh, you might be tempted to sort of just say this is a Trumpian worldview or that this is confined to the White House, but, you know, we have seen similar messaging coming from across the aisle. So uh, Michelle Flournoy, who's presumptive secretary of defense in a Biden administration, had an opinion piece in the FT where she essentially made very similar arguments to, to Pompeo. She, she called this episode a wake up call for the countries of the Indo-Pacific um, and, and said the class should, should really be worrying. And again, she connected a lot of these other dots as, uh, in a narrative that suggests this is all part and parcel of a broader sort of aggressive um, um, Chinese uh, uh, project. Um, I, I won't go into the details, but Capitol Hill as well, leading Democrats and leading Republicans similarly have described Chinese behavior as bullying and aggressive and so forth and link it to you know, a failure to, to resolve disputes through international law. So this does seem fairly widespread in terms of the, at least the, the public voices that are going forward at the moment. Um, when we talk about what is the United States doing in this, in this crisis, I think we see uh, uh, parallels to the 2017 Doklam standoff as well, which is to say that there are credible reports that the United States is, is assisting India with real-time military intelligence, but it's generally letting New Delhi set the pace and the scope of visible U.S. involvement. So early days, there was a clear messaging to don't speak up, don't get involved. New Delhi did not want to see sort of U.S.-China dynamics overshadow what was happening, either escalate or drive events in a different direction. Um, since the bloody June 15th clashes, I, I think there's been a reversal of policy there, and India has been looking for vocal support from friends and partners, which is why you're seeing more people speaking out on this issue uh, more frequently. And of course, there's also discussions that um, uh, partners like the US, like France and others are you know, prepared to provide military material and assistance uh, equipment, you know, should India ask for it, but basically letting New Delhi set the pace and the ball is very much in their court. So what then um, should we think about the future, right? Uh, uh, Harsh described that this event is very much a game changer for uh, Sino-Indian relations. Should we expect the same thing for, for U.S.-India relations, right? Are we going to look back in 10 years' time and see this as a real inflection point? And I think the answer to that is no, but only because of the extent of cooperation and partnership that the two countries have already developed. And I think it's really uh, hard to overstate this and overstate what a transformation has taken place in the last 15 years for two countries that during parts of the Cold War were arguably on opposite sides and certainly had barely concealed um, hostility. We're now in a position today where the U.S. is the second largest defense supplier to India. It gives India some of the same types of treatments that it gives um, treaty allies like South Korea and Japan when it comes to the exports of, of high-end defense materials um, 
aerospace platforms and so forth. We see extensive intelligence cooperation between the, uh, the intelligence agencies of the two countries. And very significantly, when it comes to the armed forces, the Indian military today and for some time has conducted more joint training and joint exercises with the US military than it conducts with any other military in the world. Now look, there's no question that cooperation within, with India is nowhere as easy or seamless as many in Washington would hope, and it's certainly not comparable to say what Washington enjoys with its, its close treaty allies like the UK or Australia, but at the same time, we should really see this as being a high point um, in US-India relations. The two countries in many respects are already significantly aligned, and this crisis is not going to change that. And at the same time then, the real impediments and roadblocks in the relationship are unlikely to be dramatically affected by this episode either. So Indian leaders will continue to favor a foreign policy of um, diversification that tries over, to avoid over-reliance on any one single strategic partner. Um, I think we have to recognize in that vein, whatever personal chemistry we might believe exists between President Trump and Prime Minister Modi, the US under Trump is seen as having a degree of unpredictability and unreliability um, that maybe it didn't have in the past and Indian leaders feel a need to hedge against that. Um, it's certainly the case that although uh, Washington's China policy seems to have hardened across the board, there are latent concerns in India that at some point in time, the United States and China may reach an agreement that advances their own bilateral interests in Asia at the expense of everyone else. Again, doesn't seem very, very likely from an American standpoint at the moment, but you do hear this from Indian officials from time to time. And of course, Russia remains a major defense partner for India. And although I think the extent of that strategic partnership is often overplayed, India has no desire to either alienate Russia nor to see Russia continue to act as sort of a de facto vassal state of, um, of China. So they have a, a keen interest in maintaining that relationship. And of course, look, like any partners and allies in the world, you know, the two states have a range of disagreements, whether it's trade, climate change, Iran policy, and so forth. So going back to, uh, going back to Tanvi's book, what she argues um, based on her, her history and the, the history of US-India-China relations is that the progression of Indo-US alignment is accelerated when the two countries both agree on the nature and the urgency of the challenge posed by China, as well as the prescription of what to do about it. So insofar as this episode leads to a convergence on those fronts, we may see an acceleration of cooperation in some areas, but the overall direction of travel has been set in place for some time. So this is not going to be a game changer, right? It might move us forward faster than we otherwise would have been, but we're already heading that same way. So I think on that note, I will turn things back to Louise. Thank you very much, Walter. Um, and this brings us to the point in the webinar where we will start to pose your questions to our panelists. And I've just been looking through the questions that have already posed, and I can see some clear themes running through them, which I'm going to start to pose to the panelists. While I'm doing that, if you have more questions to ask, I'd invite you to, to type them into the Q&A box now. Um, so first of all, there are a series of questions here about wider dynamics within the South Asian region and Asia more generally. And I, I, I picked out three, which um, I think we haven't dwelt on um, too much yet. Um, and I, I'll ask um, perhaps Harsh and Kerry to reflect on these three, if that's all right. Um, the first is to ask about CPEC, the China-Pakistan Economic Corridor, um, and the extent to which CPEC is affecting Indo-China Indo relations. Um, the second is a question, another question about South, a South Asian region um, and the significance of Nepal, um, another country in which China has developed close um, interest and infrastructure and also has um, major infrastructural investment. Um, so what are the Chinese and Indian strategic interests in Nepal um, and to what extent might that play into uh, kind of Indochina rivalry in the Himalayas? That's a question from Dmitry Ermakov. Um, and uh, there's a third question about the implications for wider tensions within the Indian Ocean region. Um, so Harsh, could I invite you to, to, to tackle some of those first? Uh, yeah, thanks. Thanks, Louise. I think, uh, you know, CPEC uh, is a very important uh, 
point in this relationship and the way uh, Sino-Indian relationship has evolved over the last few years itself. Uh, so you may recall, you know, that India was one of the first countries and perhaps the only major power uh, to oppose Belt and Road Initiative when it was first announced. And uh, now today, many of the many of the claims that India made have become sort of accepted arguments around the world. Uh, you know, most Western countries use those use that framework to, to challenge uh, China on on BRI. But at that point in time, India was all alone. In fact, even Washington advised India that it would be better for India to join BRI because it might feel isolated. Now, India could not have done that without actually, uh, uh, you know, reassessing or recalibrating some of the fundamental assumptions of its policy, of its foreign policy. And one of that aspect was Kashmir. So if you, uh, because the argument here was that China-Pakistan economic corridor was a frontal assault on Indian sovereignty because it signaled Chinese intent of taking a conflict that China for a long time claimed has no interest in mediating or intervening. Suddenly now China was saying, look, uh, they, the, what India calls as Pakistan occupied Kashmir is something which is, uh, you know, where we can go and engage with China, engage with Pakistan and develop infrastructure. It basically means supporting Pakistan's claim on the territory or accepting Pakistan's logic of its claim on the territory. So for India, therefore, it was as much a matter of standing up for that fundamental principle of its foreign policy uh, on Kashmir as, we, as it was about larger sort of issues which, uh, which came with it. Uh, which was, uh, you know, what kind of infrastructure projects China is financing, whether they are sustainable uh, financially, environmentally, and otherwise, whether the, the, these are unilateral measures, whether there is any capacity building happening, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. They came later on. But I think CPEC became uh, a fundamental symbol of, of India's opposition uh, to, to China. And India stood up, uh, you know, uh, to, ch to China on CPEC at a time when most countries uh, were actually willing to join the bandwagon. So I think in a sense, therefore, it also became, uh, uh, you know, a big and it has remained a big uh, uh, point of contention because um, and Terry can uh, can uh, you know, talk about it. But CPAC is such a big, you know, it's such a project, it's such closely associated with Xi Jinping's vision of China's role in the world. It's such a big part of his project of Chinese rejuvenation and China's place in the world that it's hard to see that it, India's opposition to it not having an impact uh, at the level of, of the Chinese leadership. Uh, that here was a project that China was pushing across the world and India was opposing it at every forum. And we have seen that uh, you know, uh, coming across in various uh, other forums as well. So clearly when, when you look at CPEC and we look at India's opposition to it, it had been a consistent problem. And in fact, in this case in Eastern Ladakh also, when you look at the infrastructure building from India's side and you look at Chinese opposition to it, there are many who would claim that Chinese opposition to India's infrastructure building in Ladakh, all the way, this particular road that I was talking about, all the way to Karakoram Pass, which gives India certain vantage points with, with which it can, it can access, um, uh, uh, you, know, uh, uh, you know, it, it can have uh, recon reconnaissance and uh, engagement on the other side of the border. That means that China, uh, you know, clearly felt that its own investment in CPEC might uh, also have something to lose if some of the steps that India is taking in this region are actually not prevented at, this, at the point of their uh, conceptualization at, at, at this point. So I think by and large CPEC is a big part of this engagement. Both China and India uh, are pulling and pushing uh, on this issue. Uh, and uh, final word has not yet been said on this issue. We, I think the, the Pakistani problem on CPEC is a different one because the, the project is not moving forward and we have seen some very con conflicting reports from Pakistan at one point, the reports were that, uh, that Imran Khan is going to renegotiate uh, an entire uh, set of uh, projects uh, as part of CPEC, uh, but then the next day he had to go back on that. So clearly something is happening in Pakistan that is also, that is between China and Pakistan, uh, where CPEC is not moving uh, forward, given all the problems that, uh, that perhaps uh, you know, are uh, inherent in the project itself. Uh, but for, as far as India and China are concerned, CPEC remains a point of contention. Uh, very briefly on Nepal, uh, Nepal, uh, and, and I would sort of broaden it out. Uh, the smaller states in South Asia uh, have, uh, you know, have this, have had this now uh, for, for some time now, have had the luxury of, of these two major powers and how to, uh, you know, play one off against the other. Sometimes when we look at the, these smaller states, uh, we tend to look at their engagement in the region, their foreign policies through the prism of big powers. And I think that's a mistake. Smaller powers have their agency of their own. They, are, they have their own foreign policy priorities. They are shaping that. Uh, 
in their in in, the, in what they conceive to be their, their you know their their, their interest. Uh, and clearly, uh, while India uh, has its own advantages, India has its own baggage. China has its own advantages. China has its own baggage. And in Nepal, we have seen in in in, in you know in, in the recent past, and and I think uh, what was also interesting at India and Nepal as well, uh, there is there is a there is there has been a, some back and forth between India and Nepal also on the boundary question uh, uh, on on on, on, on so Chinese leadership uh, in Kathmandu has. Uh, India claims has uh, now is now claiming parts which it had never claimed in the past, uh, and there is a sense many many in India feel that the Chinese Communist Party with its the Nepalese Communist Party that is ruling the country at the moment has close links with the Chinese Communist Party and therefore something is growing up there. Whether or not that is right, I think all successive governments in Nepal have used both India and China at various points to serve their purposes, and not only Nepal in other countries also we have seen a similar trend. And I think that trend will continue because China is now as much part of South Asia as India is, given its economic interests, given its strategic, strategic interests. And India, uh, I don't think, can wish China away. The only thing India can do is to, uh, uh, is to step up its own initiatives and to make itself a more credible actor in the region. And that seems to be the narrative at the moment. But largely, uh, what, what is happening in Nepal, what is happening in countries like even Sri Lanka or uh, Bhutan, even Bhutan, for example, we were talking of Doklam crisis. Bhutan was part of that. It was it was at the trijunction of India, Nepal, uh, India, and Bhutan, and China. So clearly, we have seen smaller countries in the region coming in the crosshairs of Sino-Indian engagement, and I think this is a trend that we should we would expect uh, and we should expect to accentuate it in, in the future as well. I think. Uh, Thanks very much, Hush. I, I might bring in um, Kerry now, if that's that's all right. Um, uh, Kerry, I, I ask you to focus on the question about the kind of. What possible implications for the wider Indian Ocean region as well? Mm. Yeah, I mean, so just a general point, and I think Ahash is right. Uh, you, you can't wish China away. Uh, I think that would be a great description of a lot of policy towards China in the last 40 years, that, that somehow uh, you, you kind of want to wish this uh, power away, but it's very uh, clear now that that won't happen um, and never was going to happen. So, you know, the kind of... Uh, uh, break the, the Belt Road Initiative is, I think, two things. First of all, it is a zone of perpetual promise. Uh, China, it's a strange diplomatic actor because it privileges stability uh, because of its own huge internal problems. And yet it also is sometimes an adventurist and, you know, does things like it has recently in Hong Kong and also on the border with India that, that sort of makes it seem like it doesn't mind instability sometimes. Um, but I think the Belt and Road, you know, kind of encapsulates that that because it, it does sort of constantly off, offer promise, but it's always about to happen. Uh, and in Pakistan, of course, things have been promised for a long time and some things have happened, but there's always more down the road. Um, and I think that's what China uses very, very effectively. Now, in the, you know, kind of ocean, the maritime area, um, it, you know, specifically where it uh, is about, well, two things. One is China's claims in the South and East China Sea in particular, but also, you know, kind of uh, maritime access, um, logistic routes, um, you know, sort of denial of access, of course, with the Americans, what have you. I, I suppose this is part of this emerging narrative of, of what China as a sea power looks like. And, and that's something that's never been seen in modern history. Um, and I guess it's, it's sort of the question is, we know the kind of tensions that have existed, and, and China as a land power is a well-known entity, but China as a maritime power is a totally new thing. And, you know, is this going to be, you know, it looks at the moment with this behavior in the South and East China Sea, like it's going to be a duplication of its behavior sometimes as a sort of a land power, uh, you know, this kind of uh, attritional behavior and a kind of accumulation of different things, re recreation of facts on the ground or facts on the water if you want to call it facts under the water sometimes so you know kind of what does it look like as a maritime actor i mean the only thing i think you can really say about that at the moment is it, it's really put a lot of uh, resources and effort into that it's in terms of vessels got more more vessels now than the united states i mean technologically it's, it's behind but you know it is a significant maritime power in a way that i don't think india is so you kind of got a very useful asymmetry for China here. Um, and it's something that it's sort of exploring and feeling its way through. It's got the strategic reason uh, to really kind of build on this because it, it doesn't like control its logistic routes for supply chains 
to be so much under American control. And I suppose, you know, kind of it's, it's, it's sort of very, very uh, aware of the fact that it also needs alternatives. That I mean, so that's part of the Belt and Road as a land concept, that it's creating kind of alternatives through Central um, Asia, as well as the sort of maritime routes. I mean, the final thing is, I mean, this is not about also not just wishing China away. I, I mean, the Belt and Road Initiative, which covers this whole area and gives it this sort of master narrative imposed by China, um, is written into the constitution now, you know, the Chinese constitution. So it is almost like a legal commitment for China to implement this huge idea. So this is going to be a part of the shaping strategic kind of environment in this region uh, for, for the future. Uh, for as long as it's in the constitution in China, it's going to shape this whole kind of area, land and maritime. So, you know, kind of India's role in this, uh, if, it is if it is to oppose the Belt and Road, is very, very significant. If it is to work with the Belt and Road, is very, very significant. But it can't be to ignore the Belt and Road. That's not going to happen. It, this idea is not going to go away. Thanks. Thanks, Terry. Um, there are some really great questions going to be coming in. I'm going to ask um, them in two more batches, broadly around um, the uh, some further questions about the US, um, and uh, but also the conditions under which foreign policy is being made within India. Um, and then there are some really interesting strategic questions, which I'm going to pitch to you, Nicola. But I'll ask um, Walter to, to come in first um, to, take a, to take a couple of questions. So a few people have asked about the role of the Quad um, and the extent to which that is likely to become a more important anti-China alliance. Um, someone has also asked whether the US is losing its influence in the region. So Harsh, of course, talked about the reality that, in, that China is now part of South Asia. Uh, what does that mean for the US's influence in, in South Asia? Um, and then there are some quite interesting questions too about um, the nature of public opinion in India and the role of uh, kind of nationalist media in India um, in stoking anti-China sentiment. So Nicola referred to some of the media reporting in China, um, but I wonder if you might reflect on the extent to which public sentiment in India is driving foreign policy decisions um, at the moment. So there's a bit of a mixed bag there, but, but if you could pick as you will, that would be great. Sure. So I'll start off with the quad, which is always a, a, a popular topic to speak about. And, you know, we are seeing more evidence even before this episode that India was shedding some of its reluctance to engage more visibly in the quad. Um, we've seen now uh, Australia has been at least invited to the Malabar exercises. So whatever the issue was that had Australia in the uh, in the naughty corner for a period of time, as um, it, it seems to have receded. I think just to parse the question, I think we have to be very careful about the Quad. Um, so the term alliance, for example, it is not an alliance. It is nothing remotely like an alliance. Really to date, it's been um, an occasional meeting of foreign ministers that you know, also all took part in one single naval exercise one time a number of years ago. Um, it is always surprising to me the degree to which the, the specter of the quad um, seems to kind of cause all sorts of reverberations in Beijing. Um, and one of the jokes that several analysts have made is that the, the biggest contribution of the quad has been to make the world safe for trilaterals. So, you know, we have India, Japan, US trilateral, India, Australia, US trilateral, Australia, Japan, India trilateral, and nobody seems to freak out over that or Seem to pose an issue. Look, one of the things India could do, and if it's thinking about how it will find its way out of the current um, situation, how it might bring pressure to bear on, on Beijing to, to give up territory if it indeed um, is really seems to be digging in, um, might be to increase the visible, um, the visible uh, uh, engagement with the Quad, to, to raise more issues through the Quad, to act more, more forcefully through the Quad. Now, Look, linkage is hard in international politics. We know that it's difficult to sort of get people to trade off one area over the other. So it's certainly a way that you can signal displeasure. Whether it would actually lead to anything meaningful um, is another question. On the, on the issue of US influence in the region, 
I mean, it's a bit tough one to say because we don't, I mean, it depends on what your baseline is of U.S. influence. As I suggested, even once the U.S. took a major interest um, in India and Pakistan during the Cold War, it's not like this, that South Asia was kind of the prime theater or the prime region of U.S. involvement. And we've already seen, certainly over the last 15 years, as the, um, as the U.S.-India relationship has taken off, Washington has already been more deferential to India's interests and has sought more often, particularly in coordinating policies towards India's um, immediate small neighbors, to work with Delhi or to make sure that they were kind of pulling in the same direction as Delhi. So um, politically, um, it seems more or less the same. The, the question, and again, this is a difficult one to parse, has to do with economic influence. So although it is the case that China is a major trading partner for every single country in the region, that's only because every single country in the region buys a ton of manufactured stuff from China. China is actually not the leading export destination for any South Asian country barring Pakistan. It's either the U.S. or Europe. So, you know, in that respect, insofar as these countries actually still really need access to your markets for their economic development, I think influence um, can remain. And then finally, on the issue of domestic politics, I mean, I think this is one real issue area where we are seeing a dramatic change. And again, um, some analysts in the United States have, have likened it to, um, have basically made the argument that the current Indian public opinion and public sentiment towards China as a result of this episode actually mirrors what we usually see vis-a-vis -vis Pakistan, which is to say this is a, a dramatic uptick in sort of anger and resentment, and we're seeing, you know, the these popular uh, uh, or popularly organized boycotts of Chinese products and stuff. But traditionally, you know, China is not understood to have had the sort of uh, political salience that the Pakistan issue has, and at least at the moment, it seems to have um, reached that point. Whether that that remains or not is an open question. Thanks, Walter. So, um, Nicola, I'm going to pose a set of more strategic oriented questions to you, um, if that's all right. Um, a couple of people have asked, I think, quite an interesting question about the, the kind of role of geography here and the potential for this to be a self-limiting conflict. Um, so Costas Simonis asks, considering the role of geography in high altitude, is this a conflict that is destined to be small scale, no matter what? Um, somebody else has said, isn't this really a case of gradual salami slicing of strategically important territory by China rather than something which is building towards a, a kind of bigger conflict? Um, so is there a kind of self-limiting... Oh, I think we might have lost Nicola. Okay, well, I'm going to continue posing these questions, but Harshal, also, you might have to pick them up. Um, so is there something essentially kind of self-limiting to the conflict by nature of the geography of of this region of Ladakh. And related to the specificity of Ladakh, one other question that we haven't dwelt on today, but which has also been raised by a number of observers, is the significance of um, India's uh, change, the recent change, or last year's constitutional change to the status of Kashmir and the abrogation of Article 370, and the extent to which the hiving off of Ladakh into a union territory um, which comes under the direct administration of the central government, has uh, been perceived by Beijing to be sufficiently threatening to have changed um, their reasoning on, on the border conflict. Um, and the, the kind of fourth strategic question is this question which I think Kerry gestured towards in his comments, is how much control do the Chinese civilian uh, leadership have over the Chinese military at the border. So Nicola, I don't know if you heard enough of those questions. I know you just dropped off and came back on, but would you like to tackle them first and then I'll ask Walter and, and ask you Thanks, Sarah. So I actually did not hear the first. I only heard the second, which was around civilian control. So if you wouldn't mind just repeating, you know, briefly the first bit. Sorry about that. That's all right. I Walter's just, I might ask, um, Walter to answer and, and, and by doing so show you the question which is really about the significance of geography here. So Walter would you like to dive yeah, in? Absolutely it, it's a very good question and I think it is a very important self-limiting factor um, and I would actually flag there's a, a recent article in War on the Rocks by a PhD student at MIT who I'm afraid I've forgotten the gentleman's name at the moment that works through this in great amount of detail 
But what, what it apparently the, the effect of geography appears to be is it creates opportunities for fait accomplis and sort of small scale territory grabbing like we've seen in this particular episode. But the difficulties of moving troops um, large distances and, and really the changing of elevation and the difficult terrain means that escalation would be quite difficult. So both countries would potentially be very vulnerable to small scale um, uh, incursions or, or grabs. Um, but the idea that this would turn into a major configuration um, in this territory is extremely unlikely was the, the takeaway. Thanks, Walter. Um, Nicola, would you like to, to come in on that? The other questions I was asking were around the significance of the abrogation of Kashmir's um, special status in the Indian constitution and the extent to which that has raised concerns in Beijing and been a driver of the, the recent increasing pressure in Ladakh specifically. Um, because of course Ladakh hasn't been central to, to, to the kind of border tensions in, in the you know, in, in, um, uh, previous years in the recent past, um, but also come in on that quest, this question of the, the extent to which the China, China, there is kind of Chinese civilian control over military action on the border. Yeah, thanks. Um, I mean, I'll just probably build a little bit on what um, uh, Walter was just saying. I think China's very limited um, battlefield experience, and it is very limited, right? The last time it fought a war was 1979. Um, and um, the wars that it had fought up to that point, so between 1949 to 1979, were actually obviously within I think we might be losing you again, Nicola. Korean War, the terrain there was. Um, and Nicola, you're breaking up here, so I think we might have to. Um, so I'm, I'm going to hand over to Walter for, for almost the final word now, because we're almost at, at the end. I'm sorry we've lost Nicola there, but um, Walter, would you like to come in on the Article 370 question? And, Sure, and this has come up and been mentioned in a number of, uh, by a number of, of people as, as being a, a significant issue. And, you know, we have also seen um, the, the Indian Home Minister, uh, Amit Shah, raise the issue both of, you know, India reclaiming uh, POK as well as um, Aksai Shin. I just have a real hard time seeing what the connection here is in the sense that the Article 370 does not in any way change um, the nature of, of India's claims in Askai Chin or make any difference in that respect. And conversely, um, you know, when we think through, this is, you know, I come from the Department of War Studies, we think strategically, what would be the objective of seizing these territories? So you capture patrol point 14 or finger five on a lake somewhere and what what do you think will happen india will reconstitute a state because you're going to trade off this territory it's, it's really hard to see how a military operation like this would lead to that kind of political change you could show your displeasure but i mean did when, when, when she and modi you know went down south and sat on a swing together did they talk about these issues do we have a lot of evidence that china was repeatedly raising this and then rebuffed i i i don't see it i know other people keep pointing to it but i don't i don't really see that connection brilliant well thank you very much Walter, for that, that final um reflection um we have reached the end of today's webinar and it's been an enormously stimulating discussion covering a lot of ground um and I think really shows how fruitful it is to bring together India and China specialists for this kind of discussion. And I hope we'll do much more of that in, in months and years to come. So thanks very much to all our panelists. Thanks very much to everyone who attended today. Um, and just to let you know that there will be a recording of the webinar, um, which we will send out um, after the event. So thank you very much and goodbye for today. Thank you. Thank you, Louise.